Hamlet has multiple poetic forms inside, but the most important, the primary poetic form for Hamlet and for Shakespeare's plays generally is blank verse. There are others. There is some rhymed verse here. There is some, some often pentameter, iambic pentameter couplets, typically used to create a sense of formal closure that ends a scene. The time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to put it right. He rhymed. It's the end of, it must be the end of the scene. He rhymed a couplet there. There are some songs which have different, have rhyme and different metrical rules. The lines are shorter than I have a And there's a good deal of prose. Sometimes the characters who are mostly speaking in poetry just stop and speak in prose. Whenever Hamlet shifts from one poetic form to another, into rhyme, out of rhyme, into ver from verse into prose, from prose into verse, pay attention. It means something just changed, and it's probably important. It's not the same thing every time. There's not an easy decoder ring which allows us to tell, say that, oh, Hamlet just switched. <laughs> Hamlet just switched to, ver to prose, so he must be getting crazier. It's not that simple. It's more like Hamlet just switched to prose, so something is different. What is it? What's different? That's for you as an English major to think about. If the answers were straightforward, we wouldn't really have this class. We'd just have a kind of quick answer sheet. Now, all those aside, the most important, as I said, is blank verse, and I want to discuss exactly what blank verse is and what it isn't. What it is not, and what some of you really want to call it, is free verse. Free verse is where there are no rules, man. Not only is there no rhyme, but there's no meter. Dude, every line is whatever length you think it ought to be. How long does a life feel to you? Man, that's all great. But that's not what Shakespeare does. That is for very experimental 19th century poets and for lots of mainstream 20th and 21st century poets. And free verse is terrific, but that's not what this is. This is blank verse, which is no rhyme, all meter. Now I know some of you value rhyme above meter. There are many reasons for this, especially um, because of your educational experiences. Most of you as early readers were exposed to books that heavily emphasized rhyme because rhyme is often used to teach early readers how to kind of notice phonics. So, and, yeah, and scansion doesn't get taught, versification doesn't get taught in K through 12 that much, and when it does, it's rapid and confusing. So you, you value rhyme because you know what it is. You, some of you don't value meter because you don't know what it is, and it seems strange. But really, if you can count to 11, and even English majors can count to 11, you can get iambic pentameter down. Here's the thing. Shakespeare thinks you're wrong. Shakespeare thinks you're wrong. Milton is convinced you're wrong, and Milton cannot be argued with. For Shakespeare, it's the meter that matters. Meter counts, the beat, the rhythm not the rhyme. He can write a, a wonderful poem without rhyming at all. Milton is going to write a very serious masterpiece, all meter, no rhyme, and, there's a, and he will talk to you at great length about what is wrong with rhyme and what you're wrong to like it. I'm not saying you're wrong to like it, but meter, you're wrong to undervalue meter. Blank verse is about iambic pentameter. It is a 10 syllable, sometimes an unstressed 11 syllable. Five stress syllables, they tend heavily to happen in, in the even numbers. Unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. That rhythm is what carries this play forward, gives it, gives the, the, the language propulsion, and, and it's what makes it feel coherent. It's also an extremely flexible line, beloved beloved, as I've said before, of hundreds of years of major English poets. Shakespeare uses it like a master in Hamlet. So I would like to explain some of his key I am a contaminator game in maybe the most famous passage in Shakespeare, in Hamlet, in Shakespeare, in English literature. Let's start with the beginning of To Be or Not To Be. To Be or Not To Be. 
That is the question. Okay. Is that poetry? Yes. Does it rhyme? Did you have trouble understanding it? Were there any words you didn't understand? To be, to be, or not. That is the question. Thank you, know all those words. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or take arms against a sea of, a sea of troubles and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep no more, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation devoutly to be rich, to die, to sleep. To sleep perchance to dream. Ah, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the laws delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with the bare bodkin? Who would fardels bear to sweat, grunt, and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death? The undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience doth make cowards of, does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sickly o'er with the pale cast of thought. The enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now. The fair Ophelia, nymph in thy orisons, be all my sins remembered. It doesn't end with a full line. Actually, it ends three syllables short. The rest of the last of that line is the three syllables of Ophelia's next line. Good, my lord. Let me uh, let me talk about. I'm not going to cover all the content here. I want to talk about some technical things. One of the things that's happening here is there's a fair amount of enjambment. Enjambment is when a line of verse runs through into the, where the syntactical unit grammatically runs through that kind of stop sign at the end of the line into the next line. Um, so, for example, if I put a pause after, actually, to, and by a sleep to say we end, the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that the flesh is there to, if I pause at the end of every line, it sounds stupid. Um, there's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. Okay, you have to run through there, because if you say there's the respect that makes calamity of so long life, you sound like a robot with a bad battery. Enjambment is the opposite of end stopping. End stopping is where the grammatical unit, is where the period, the comma, the place where you would normally pause, comes at the end of the line. Line of verse, and end of line, end of sentence together, works great in rhyme, bingo, bango, it's together. Enjambment is when you start to move through, as in some ways I just, uh, I just started, uh, to take arms against, uh, yeah, you're just fortunate to take arms against, like you know, let's uh, end step, end step. Um, there's the respect that makes Columbia so long life, and jamming. It's easier to enjam more once your audience gets used to ambient contaminant, once they've had the beat in their head. Shakespeare is writing Hamlet when there's been an entire generation, and maybe two or three artistic generations, of English language iambic contaminant drama on the stage. 20 years earlier, 15 years earlier, he'd have had to end stop much more heavily, and he could not vary his beat that much because people were still learning to follow the iambic contaminant beat. At this point, everyone in his audience, even some of the newbies, have internalized that beat. They, they are listening for the thing, they're listening for the meter, and they're prone to recognize it so he can be a little looser with it. So he can jam more heavily. If you like enjambment, wait till we get to Milton. Secondly, he can substitute more. Now, it is true that iambic pentameter stresses the even beats as a general rule. It doesn't stress them every single time. Some beats are very regular. Spencer tends to have a very regular iambic beat. And, not, and to vary it surprisingly little for a poet of an incredible skill. It's actually incredible to keep the poetry not boring when he ever varies it. Shakespeare can be a little looser, loosey-goosey, or he can allow you 
he can substitute a different kind of foot somewhere in the beginning or middle of the line. The last foot is almost always very dynamic. It keeps, that's important to keep the pattern. The first one might not be at all. Whether it is nobler in the mind, it is clear, actually, the second line of soliloquy, whether the first foot is clearly trochaic, the op a troche, the opposite of an iamb. It is clearly whether or not, whether, whether it is, no, 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 whether. He can hit the first beat first rather than the second beat because the rest and the rest of the line moves back into the adequate pattern. He can break the pattern here and there. He can, it is mostly iambic most of the time. And if you feel it, to feel the pattern, so then he can vary it. Speaking of it, something else about iambic pentameter, all stresses are not alike. Some are harder, some are stronger. One thing that happens too, since iambic pentameter meter counts syllables and beats, it counts feet, little units of stressed and unstressed syllables in whatever combination, it doesn't count words. When you use one syllable words, it will slow the line down. When you use longer words, you will get through an iambic pentameter line pretty fast. The Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's names, because they're very long, tend to speed up lines. In fact, it's partly a joke Shakespeare is playing. <laughs> the phrase Rosencrantz and Guildenstern takes up 70% of an epic pentameter line. It leaves only three syllables left to play with. What can you do? How many ways can you fit the phrase Rosencrantz and Guildenstern into a 10 syllable line? How many ways? This many ways, because Shakespeare does it every single way. He's showing off a little bit for the, 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 the versification fans there. That like, how are you gonna do that when their, their names are seven together, are seven syllables long? The Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Where should we have our next? So the flesh is heir to, tis a consummation. The flesh is heir to a slow consummation speeds it up. To die, to sleep, calamity is fast, the insolence of the, um, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Slings and arrows are slow, it speeds up. Something else to talk about. There is sometimes that 11th syllable is called a feminine ending. Is that term probably sexist? Yeah, probably. I wasn't at the meeting. I have to use that term because that's the term every class uses and I don't want to miseducate you. I want you to know the terms that other people use. Here, where's it? Here's it. Here, actually, two examples from our first line. To be or not to be, that is the question. I point out, first of all, this line is not perfectly iambic, or it's an actor's choice. I read it as with a substitution. To be or not to be, that is iambic as all get out. And you can't read it any other way. You cannot read it as to be or not to be. Like, no, to be or not to be. Now, if I was going to force an iambic beat, a perfect iambic beat under this line, I would say, to be or not to be, that is the question. Maybe. Sometimes it's easier or more natural to say, to be or not to be, that is the question. That, rather than is, gets stressed. So it's, I am, I am, I'm, trokey. I am, and then a feminine ending. We have a little bit of, we take the foot off the pedal a little bit and reverse the beat that one so like only you know only 60 only 60 percent of the way through the first line of the most famous iambic pentameter speech in this language okay there's also that little 11th feminine ending question one of the effects that can have it doesn't always but here it creates a little sense of anti-climax there's an earlier version of this earlier printed version of this speech that does not and i mean i there's the rub which um, does not sound nearly as good, but does end solidly without some. I there's also, I there's the point. There's that little anticlimax, that little let down. This is a speech in which Hamlet is feeling a loss of energy, etc. And there's that little weak downbeat, unstressed syllable. If you think I'm exaggerating, it's not an accident. There's a feminine ending for the next three lines too. The first four lines of the speech all end with a feminine ending. That is not an accident. That creates an effect. It's a subtle effect. 
It creates an effect where poets really work in your ear through the sounds of the words itself. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the scene of tr troubles. Troubles. Fortune. Fortune? No, fortune. It, it's a letdown. It's an anti there's The anticlimax is part of the poetry itself. This is how you understand Shakespeare by listening to the sounds of the words and the very subtle effects he creates with the music of the words themselves. Poetry is simply a form of music. It's an extreme acapella. The music is arranged for the speaking human voice, and it comes from the natural sounds of the words themselves. That's how Shakespeare works. This is blank verse. It's not rhyme, but it's poetic as all get out. And the craft is extremely intricate.